Hi, I'm Tom Austin. I'm currently the world expert on the field identification of biology at the Intricate Seder. I recently published a um, manuscript in the Journal of the Lepidoptera Society this month uh, that details my recent findings and covers pretty much everything I'm going to go over in this video if you'd like to go into it in uh, more detail. Today I'm going to be presenting a short lecture on how to identify the Intricate Seder and hopefully with some accompanying graphics. Now, in case you've never heard of the Intricate Seder before and, say, someone mentioned it to you on an outing or you have that one guy in your Lepidoptera Society who says, oh, you can't record that as a Carolina Seder because we can identify between Hermioptychia intricata and Hermioptychia sissivius in the field, so you're just going to have to mark all of these 1,000 uh, satyrs as Hermioptychia sp in your list. Now for some quick background information on the species. Uh, the intricate satyr is a cryptic species of butterfly that was first described in 2014 by a team of researchers who were studying the genetics of the Hermioptychia genus in North America. They accidentally discovered two new species of cryptic satyr that had previously been confused with the, with the Carolina satyr. The, the South Texas satyr, which is found only in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, and the intricate satyr, which is found throughout the southeastern coastal plain from Texas all the way up to North Carolina. And the intricate satyr had been confused throughout the range of the Carolina satyr with the Carolina satyr for the last 221 years. It, remarkable. So those researchers described um, morphological differences in the species, particularly in the genitalia. Uh, they are reproductively isolated from the Carolina satyr, even though they share an expansive overlapping range uh, by their genitalia. They, they're just physically incompatible. There's no ability for them to hybridize, which is also remarkable. So that research team noted some morphological differences in the uh, ventral hind wing morphology as well as the genitalia, as I just mentioned. Later that same year, another team of researchers in Florida um, described uh, another morphological difference on the dorsal surface of the forewing in males. Uh, there's androconia on the wing in Carolina satyrs that uh, appears as a visible dark spot at the base of the forewing and this is absent in male intricate satyrs. Uh, they, they also made some comments on the behavior and habitat preferences of the two spe species in Florida, and in the locations that they examined, they could not find any real discernible difference. So those three papers are the, um, the sum total knowledge we have on the intricate satyr in the uh, world of publications. Um, four years later, uh, I started my research on the intricate satyr here in coastal South Carolina, and I recently just uh, published my own manuscript uh, detailing um, methods for field identification as well as the life history, biology, and ecology of the intricate satyr. So my lecture here today is to pass that information on to you and hopefully um, get you up to speed on how to identify these two species in the field. The confusion between these two species is uh, very much forgivable because the two are, like I said earlier, almost identical in appearance. However, there are a few key morphological differences that you can use to identify between these two species in the field uh, with about 98 to 99 percent accuracy, as I've found with my own experience. Now let's get into the meat and potatoes. How do I identify between these two things? As you can see, the intricate satyr and the Carolina satyr look remarkably similar. Uh, but there are a few key morphological uh, differences that you can look at to make a proper and accurate field identification. Uh, I'm going to go through these in order of um, how diagnostic they are, how, um, how concrete of an ID you can make off of these features. So first off, the most concrete is by examining the genitalia. However, um, you can't do this with a live individual. This is not a form of field identification. However, if you collect and dissect specimens, this is the best way of identifying them. And this is much easier for males. Uh, with males, you can um, squeeze the back of the abdomen with a pair of tweezers, and you can expose the, um, the uncus, which you can examine. And in male intricate satyrs, they have a pointed tip to the uncus, and in a Carolina satyr, it is truncated, flat. Now, this next one is a form of field identification, and this is the best form of identification to use, the most concrete, and that is examination of the male dorsal surface of the forewing. However, as you can um, imply there, this only works for males. In the male Carolina satyr, there is a dark patch at the base of the forewing. 
and in the male intricate satyr, there is no dark surface here. And in females of both species, the basal portion of the dorsal surface of the forewing looks identical. This also brings up the issue that you have to identify the individual you're examining to sex. You have to be able to tell if it's a male or a female, otherwise you can't use this form of identification, unless it is a male Carolina satyr, because it'll have that dark basal patch and it'll be very obvious. So for a female, they're going to have a more oval-shaped abdomen. It's sort of egg-shaped, um, and typically if you look at it at a profile view, it usually curves upward. It's much more three-dimensional, and in a male, you have a sort of finger-shaped abdomen. It's very skinny and narrow. It's about the same width throughout, and there's usually a little bit of fuzz at the end of the abdomen, but that's not always reliable. Um, so you have to be able to get a good enough photo that you can tell if it's a female or a male, and if you have a male, then you have to be able to tell if it's a Carolina satyr or an intricate satyr based on the um, presence of androconia, or the lack of androconia. Um, this is the best, best method to use. If you're in an area where there's never been a record of a population, this is what I recommend using, of either collecting an individual and looking for this uh, physically in the hand, or by uh, just waiting it out and getting a dorsal surface photo. Uh, this, this is what I would go with if you're, if you're getting like a, a state or like a, um, a regional record, like the, the first in the upstate for your state or something like that, or a, a site that no one else has ever surveyed. Now, the form of identification you're going to be using most of the time is examining the post-median line on the ventral surface of the hind wing, and this works for both sexes and both species. Uh, there are some key differences in the morphologies that you can look at between the two species that are consistent in the vast majority of individuals. Uh, for about 95% of in individuals, it's, it's a very easy identification once you learn how to do it. Alright, so what is the post-median line? The post-median line is the wavy line on the hind wing that's below the eye spots and it's after the median. It's post-median. It's after the middle. And the area of this line that you're going to be going to want to be looking at is the top half uh, from M3 up to the costa towards the apex. Um, in the Carolina Sater, uh, the line is a lot more wavy, but in particular around um, the M1 vein, it bulges outward away from the first large eye spot, the second eye spot down from the apex. Uh, that, that's key to note, that's something you really need to pay attention to, and at M2 it bulges distad, outward, towards the eye spots. And that, that one's not as key, but it is, it's very important to note which vein that is occurring on, whether it's M2 or M3, because in the intricate satyr, as you can see the line is very straight, and at M3 it doesn't quite bulge, but it bumps. It's got a corner or a slight little bump around M3, and that's what you really want to pay attention to, is that bump and the lack of any bulge around M1. Although there can be some curvature in this line, it's not always straight, sometimes it's even a little zigzaggy, but you really want to pay attention to that M3 bump and any bulging away from that second eye spot, you really want to pay attention to because that means it's much more likely to be a Carolina Sater. Now I know what you're thinking, wow, that's subtle. It is, and that was actually the name of uh, Warren et al.'s paper, was Subtle Satyrs, which was their second paper, which was a summarization of their first paper, and um, their graphics really do a great job. I would definitely look at uh, their paper for information about how to identify from the post-median line. Uh, they were not able to make any conclusive um, uh, statements about its utility in the field, but with uh, my research and my experience, um, I'm, I'm able to corroborate their findings and say that it's it's pretty much diagnostic for 99% of individuals. There's there's a 1% that's just unidentifiable by this method. And that should be noted is this is not 100% diagnostic. There are some individuals that cannot be identified by this. And just don't be afraid to just label something Hermioptychia sp because it's going to take you a while before you get good at this. But once once you do, uh, you're going to be rock solid and it's going to be an easy ID for you, right? except for the fact that you're going to have to glass the butterfly every single time to get a conclusive ID.
However, as I'll explain later, there are some methods in order to um, to narrow down your search and um, make uh, very quick course IDs. All right, the next morphological uh, feature that you can pay attention to is called the sinuous band gap, and that was um, that term and this feature were first discovered by a um, photographer in Alabama, uh, an, an amateur entomologist who uh, discovered. Um, some variation in this between the two species, and I've published his findings for him in my paper. So what is the sinuous band gap? The sinuous band gap is the area on the tornal corner of the ventral surface of the hind wing, down there at the bottom corner, below the, um, the terminal eye spot, the tornal most eye spot, where the postmedian line and the submarginal line meet and they form a void, an empty area between the eye spot and the joining of the two lines. There's an empty gap on the wing where, and the shape of this gap and the shape of the the sinuous lines here in this corner uh, can help you identify the t between the two species. Currently I do not consider this uh, a diagnostic form of identification. This is um, supplemental. Uh, it should be used as a supplemental form of identification to complement the postmedian line or the uh, or um, other behavioral and habitat uh, differentiations I'll be telling you in a minute. Uh, in the Carolina satyr, the sinuous band gap can either be very large, very wide, very open, very U-shaped, uh, V-shaped, or it can be much more narrow, pointed, sort of curved like a um, raptor claw, or it can just be completely uh, reduced, truncated. It can just be a like almost a uh, border around the bottom of the last of the terminal eye spot. And in the intricate satyr, it's almost always large, open, and U-shaped. Uh, there is variability in this, and it, it can be a little more V-shaped, but there's almost always a significant gap here. Whereas in the Carolina satyr, it ranges from very large gap to a moderately sized gap to a, a sort of squished gap to a flattened gap to completely truncated and I've even seen like isolated like s lines separate from this. Um, the Carolina satyr has a high degree of variability in this um, morphological feature whereas the intricate satyr it's much more consistent. Once again this is a uh, supplementary, supplementary uh, morphological identification characteristics. Do not make an ID based solely off of this. Um, you can't do it. Um, unless someone comes out with a paper and proves me wrong using machine learning or something like that, but at our current understanding it's n not a diagnostic feature. However, although it is supplementary, these extremely reduced sinuous band gaps in the Carolina satyrs are almost diagnostic. Uh, I would even hazard to say that they are diagnostic. These really extreme reductions, I have never seen an individual of an intricate kit intricate satyr display that, and I've got dozens and dozens of photos of intricate satyrs, and I've observed hundreds of intricate satyrs in the field, and I've never seen this feature in an intricate satyr, but I've seen it in about 5 to 10 percent of Carolina satyrs. They have some sort of advanced reduction of the sinuous band gap that you can almost quite um, make an ID off of alone. However, this is usually accompanied by, you know, diagnostic differences in the post-median line or a or it's a male with visible um, androconia on the dorsal surface of the forewing. And as time goes on, this may become a diagnostic feature as more data is collected. Now, that's all of the diagnostic features between these two species that we currently know of that can be used for field identification. However, there are supplementary um, uh, notes about the biology, ecology, uh, life history, and habitat preferences of the two species that you can use to further refine your ID when a concrete ID is not possible, or to um, better identify potential populations that warrant further searching, uh, further observational scrutiny in order to determine if there is a population of intricate satyrs there, say in a location where they've never been observed before or you've never found one in your state or this county. Alrighty, so the first of these supplementary uh, non-morphological um, distinctions between the two species I'd like to touch on is behavior. and This is the most useful for field identification. I found in my experience that regardless of environmental conditions or individual age, intricate satyrs are consistently 
less skittish, less active, more lethargic, they have slower wing beats, uh, they move shorter distances when disturbed, and they're just much more photogenic. They're a lot easier to approach in the field, whereas Carolina satyrs will just get up and take off, go 30 foot off into the woods, you'll be chasing them for five minutes before you can get a photo, and you gotta take the photo from 20 foot away just to just to look at it on your camera and go, oh, it's Carolina satyr. And this has been very consistent. Uh, the the hardest, uh, the time that this is the least useful is when you have worn individuals um, and it's, you know, early morning and it's cool out and they're just not active because your Carolina satyrs aren't going to be as active and your intricate satyrs are, this is when they're most similar, but when it's middle of the day and you got fresh individuals, um, it's really obvious, especially in like late spring, early summer. I, I know just me talking about behavior isn't really doing it justice, and I found that it's it's impossible to film this, otherwise I would have some video for you. But, um, yeah, in, intricate satyrs, they're, they're much more lethargic, they're much easier to approach and photograph uh, than Carolina satyrs, which are much more active. Um, um, my guideline for this is, if if you have to chase a butterfly to get a photo of it, and I mean chase, I mean borderline jogging through the woods, it's not an intricate satyr. An intricate satyr might might lead you around for five minutes, but you're just going to be casually walking behind it as it hovers around over the, stays rather close to vegetation, and doesn't really go anywhere. And when you do startle it, it moves three foot. It doesn't get up and take off yards at a time. Another good piece of supplementary information that you need to take into account when looking at these species in the field is habitat. I found that intricate satyrs are, um, they highly prefer uh, wetland habitats, ephemeral wetlands, um, especially riparian forests, uh, old floodplain forests and, and the like, uh, not just on river systems but also on oxbows, just floodplain forest in general. Um, bottomland hardwood forests, swamps, uh, uh, depressional wetlands, that sort of thing. Um, and, and the ephemeral wetlands down here on the coast on the barrier islands. But inland a ways, it's usually, um, I've seen them most often in uh, riparian forests around rivers. And they do get up out of the floodplain forest as well, but they seem to stay isolated on um, ephemeral wetlands. Uh, and Another key characteristic of the habitat they prefer is really dense grass. Things like um, chasmanthium, uh, dicanthelliums, uh, lyrsia, um, uh, also sedges as well. Uh, they seem to prefer um, the habitat that's in between where sedges are and in between where uh, the grasses disappear. They like that grassy area that surrounds um, ephemeral wetlands outside the sedges. In, in from the, um, the forest floor where the vegetation is really dense, the grass is really heavy, they really like that. Um, I've seen them most often in hardwood forests. They do not seem to like pine forests at all. Uh, mixed hardwood coniferous forests don't seem to be an issue for them, but they don't seem to occur where pines occur, and I don't know if that's just because pines can't survive in the, the habitats they prefer, or if the pines exclude the satyrs. Who knows? That, that's some more complicated uh, ecology stuff that I had just haven't gotten into. But what you're, the species you're going to want to look for is you're, in your canopy, um, you're going to want to look for uh, things like swamp chestnut oak, uh, water oak, um, black gum, sweet gum, uh, spruce pine, you know, your, your, uh, your more mesic adapted species, uh, maples as well. Uh, they, they don't like swamp, they don't like um, permanent water, but they, they seem to have a strong preference for ephemeral wetlands. Along with a really dense um, understory, they really like uh, a heavy, uh, mature canopy. They, they like shade. Uh, they like wet soil, dense grass, mature shaded canopy. Uh, and you, you almost never see them in areas like this. Um, disturbed areas where there's plenty of, say, turf grass available. Because I've seen Carolina satyrs right here, actually. 
the biggest difference between these two species is um, the intricate satyr seems to be really specialized for ephemeral wetlands um, with dense vegetation and a mature um, hardwood canopy, whereas the Carolina satyr is a generalist. It, it doesn't care. Um, I see them everywhere. I see them on lawns, I see them in uh, pine forests, I see them in wetlands, I see them in bottomland hardwood forests, I see them in xeric scrublands, I see Carolina satyrs everywhere that there are host plants available, and some amount of shade on that host plant. And also, as a note for host plants, the host plant of both the intricate satyr and the Carolina satyr are grasses. The intricate satyr seems to really prefer fresh growth of um, wetland grass species. I, I think the they have a preference for um, high soil mo moisture, and that just sort of excludes other grass species. They really like um, fresh growth. I've seen them primarily on dicanthelliums, but I've also seen oviposition on chasmanthium. Uh, those are the only two host plants I've observed for the intricate satyr. I don't know if they'll eat chasmanthium, but uh, I have seen multiple oviposition's on chasmanthium by female intricate satyrs, and I've found tons of caterpillars on both dicanthelium commutatum and dicanthelium dicotomum. Also, the two species uh, do not have exclusive habitat. Uh, I see intricate satyrs and Carolina satyrs flying together all the time. Uh, Carolina satyrs can be found in the same habitats as intricate satyrs. There seems to be some exclusivity in larval habitat um, between the two species. It seems that intricate satyrs fill a niche that the Carolina satyr can't. I think the intricate satyr caterpillars might be more resistant to uh, uh, periodic flooding, especially during the winter over the Carolina satyr because I've found, it seems to be that the intricate satyr excludes the Carolina satyr from its preferred larval habitat, and I don't know if that's just because the Carolina satyr, um, if, if their um, larval survivability is just too low in these habitats or something, but uh, you often find intricate satyrs and Carolina satyrs flying together in the same habitat. Uh, usually uh, the preferred intricate satyr habitat is surrounded by suitable Carolina satyr habitat, you'll see the two flying together where these habitats adjoin but when you get like deep into the heart of like you know an ephemeral wetland you pretty much only see intricate satyrs and there is exclusivity in larval habitat but they often fly together so you're gonna have to learn to pick these things out uh, when they're flying together and on well we're on adult flight patterns um, the two have since they don't hybridize and they're completely genetically isolated uh, the two have asynchronous adult emergences. Um, I've often seen um, Carolina satyrs flying exclusively, and then I see them um, integrated together, flying together, and then I'll only see intricate satyrs, or vice versa. It seems to be that Carolina satyrs are the first to emerge in spring. I've seen them as early as February, and it's usually not until um, late March, early April, that I start seeing intricate satyrs. And then, as, th as the Carolina satyrs fade out, the intricate satyrs are the only thing left, and the intricates fade out. Uh, and they usually fly together throughout summer. However, I have observed that um, the intricate satyr seems to have, like, a sort of... in um, floodplain forest, I'll see the intricate satyr in, like, late August, and I won't see any Carolina satyrs. And then the Carolina satyrs won't start showing up until September or something like that. This isn't always the case, but this does happen sometimes, and I don't know if it's uh, environmentally related. It might have something to do with the flooding I was talking about. But um, the, the two emerge asynchronously, so sometimes you will only see one species. And you may be at a, uh, a habitat that does support intricate satyrs, but you may only see Carolina satyrs because you showed up at the wrong time. Or vice versa, you may be at an area that has both species and you only see intricate satyrs. And then as time progresses, you visit, say, once a week or something like that, Carolina satyrs start to show up and then the intricates start to fade. And you can see this by differences in the wear patterns in the adults. Alrighty, hopefully you're now uh, quasi-fluent on how to identify these two species, and I hope uh, that you'll be able to um, correctly identify these species uh, as time goes on. Um, I hope more people keep researching this topic because <laughs> I'm tired of being the world expert because I keep having to identify things for people. Um, not, not really. I enjoy it. I get to flex. I, get, I got some clout. I'm sorry this lecture got a little long-winded or if I'm a little hard to, uh, to follow. Um, read my paper. Read Warren's papers. Read uh, Kong and Grishin's paper. Um, 
they, they really do a much better job of, of uh, speaking about the post-median line than I do. I didn't mention it in my paper much um, because, well, it, there was nothing else left to say other than I think it's diagnostic. Anyway, I hope with the publication of this paper that uh, people will um, be able to identify between these two species in the field because, as it stands, we don't really know much of anything about it, and if you can't identify the things, then nobody knows where they are and then nobody can study them because there's no idea of what counties they exist in, what locations they're they're found in, what habitats they seem to prefer, whether they have tend to have an isolated population or they tend to have a continuum, how they respond to disturbance or environmental change, whether they're quick to uh, return after a disturbance or such. There's myriads of things um, that we don't know about this species. Uh, because of how it's been confused with the Carolina satyr, and likewise, there's myriads of things about the Carolina satyr that we know that are probably wrong, and that are actually supposed to be part of the intricate satyr. I'm Tom Austin. I'm the world authority on the intricate satyr. I hope that will soon change, um, and I hope this video helped you somewhat.